ready to take this country in a fundamentally new direction. That's what's happening in America right now. Change is what's happening in America. We are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. On Election Day 2008, 69 and a half million Americans, more than half of all those who cast a ballot, voted in favor of the candidate who promised fundamental transformation of America. It's been a long time coming, but tonight, because of what we did on this day, in this election, at this defining moment, change has come to America. Almost two years removed from that night in Chicago, a question begs to be answered. Did the millions of people who voted for candidate Obama understand what they were voting for? Did any of us, for that matter, know what the promise of fundamental transformation even meant? Did we truly grasp what the audacity of hope, a phrase borrowed from a sermon delivered by the Reverend Jeremiah Wright, was really all about? I think that was exciting to the liberal media and to the far left. We wanted something totally new. We were mired in an unpopular war. Our economy was in trouble. Sort of the zeitgeist was rallying for something totally different. By design, the details of how the transformation would occur, the nuts and bolts, were in very short supply. But Obama's commitment to the concept of its blanket application were never in question. Affairs of state. We need a fundamental change. Energy. And fundamentally changing. Government. To bring fundamental change. On the economy. That's how we're going to change the country. National security. You and I together will change the country and change the world. Ever considered the true meaning of the words he just used? A check in the dictionary provides interesting insight. Fundamental. A central part of a foundation or basis. Transformation. Change in form. Appearance, nature, or character. Stop and think about this. What if the campaign promised that day at the University of Missouri had been, we are five days away from changing the appearance, the nature, the character of the very foundation of America. As we know now, in the disingenuous world of politicians, campaign slogans, and talking points, fundamental transformation was a bold tech declaration of honest intent and it's turning out to be the rare campaign promise kept we um, increasingly by the general election very rarely did we communicate through the press anything that we didn't absolutely control the words that Barack Obama used this promise of something genuinely new he didn't really define what that was going to be. There was no point at which then Senator Obama said, vote for me and I'm going to nationalize the student loan program, or vote for me and I'm going to nationalize savings and loans, or I'm going to nationalize the major automobile manufacturers. A huge part of our press strategy was focused on making the media cover what Obama was actually saying, as opposed to, you know, why the campaign was saying it what the tactic was. One of the reasons we did so many of the David Plouffe videos was not just for our supporters, but also because it was a way for us to get our message out without having to actually talk to reporters. Obama ran as a transformational post-partisan figure, and the media handed all of that directly to the American people, un unanalyzed, unfiltered. The truth is, we should have known what was happening. There were plenty of of clues, and had we checked, we would have discovered that history was simply repeating itself. Progressive candidates for president have always played hide and seek, a little game with the American voters, afraid that revealing the radical nature of their true intentions would render them unelectable. They've always employed a tell them what they want to hear strategy, hiding their true identity until the die is cast. We have in this party two things a political party, and a body of social reformers. Case in point, World War I underway in Europe. Woodrow Wilson hits the campaign trail. It's 1916, 
He's campaigning for his second term as the president who kept us out of war. He was using that to appeal to the strong anti-war sentiment among most Americans. Throughout his campaign, the message was clear. To keep the peace, Wilson had to be returned to office. One month into his second term, Wilson asked Congress to declare war on Germany. May this be the symbol of my intention to be honest and to avoid all hypocrisy or sham. In 1932, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the man responsible for the greatest expansion of our government in history, the father of the government bailout and entitlements, whose presidency bordered on a dictatorship, ran for election as a conservative. During the course of the campaign, he and his running mate, John Nance Gardner, brutally criticized incumbent Herbert Hoover for excessive spending and big government, going so far as to accuse him of leading America down the road to socialism. Present leadership in Washington stands convicted, not because it did not have the means to plan, but fundamentally because it did not have the will to do. According to the book Brains Trust by FDR confidant Rex Tugwell, the president's strategy heading into the 1932 election was to reassure regular Democrats who were worried about radical candidates like Huey Long and socialist Norman Thomas and ultimately reveal as little as possible about the progressive agenda he planned to put in place once he reached the White House. FDR went to great lengths to hide his true intent. Stamped prominently on the front of a pamphlet outlining the 1932 Democratic platform is the line, I am for this platform 100%, signed Franklin Roosevelt. Ironically, one of the planks in the platform called for an immediate and drastic reduction of governmental expenditures and a savings of not less than 25% in the cost of the federal government. Now the truth with candidate Obama was that he was far less deliberate and calculated when it came to keeping his agenda under wraps. There were clues ignored, associations dismissed, or not adequately vetted, or in some cases, just outrightly buried by the mainstream media. I think when you spread the wealth around, it's good for everybody. Let's start with Frank Marshall Davis. Who was he and what kind of an influence did he have on young Barack Obama? For Barack Obama's connection with the one-time radical turned professor Bill Ayers. No, no, no! Not God bless America! God damn America! I definitely welcome uh, Acorn's input. You don't have to ask me about that. I'm going to call you even if you, if you didn't ask me. Senator Obama went out of his way today to avoid reporters and their questions. It was this morning's Chicago Sun-Times, as you point out, that reported that many of the buildings that Tony Resco was supposed to transform into affordable housing are today unlivable or boarded up. Eleven of those buildings are in what was State Senator Barack Obama's district. The McCain camp has now joined those demanding the Los Angeles Times release a 2003 video that shows Barack Obama celebrating with a group of Palestinians hostile to Israel. Peter Walston wrote in April about Obama's association with former Palestinian operative Rashid Khalidi. Your agenda has been my agenda in the United States Senate. Before debating health care, I talked to Andy Stern and SEIU members. Before immigration, debates took place in Washington. I talked with Alcia Medina and SEIU members. It's not who's talking about your agenda, but who can change our politics in Washington so we can actually make your agenda a reality. And then there was candidate Obama's admiration for FDR and his New Deal. And this prophetic passage regarding the U.S. economy from his pre-election book, Audacity of Hope, we can begin to modernize and rebuild the social contract that FDR first stitched together in the middle of the last century. In other words, a new, new deal, which Americans are seeing now unfold in front of their very eyes.
No matter how many times I hear Franklin Roosevelt praised for having ended the Great Depression, no matter how often Barack Obama implicitly or explicitly likens himself to FDR, I need, I need to remind myself and others that the New Deal was not a huge economic success, uh, that the U.S. economy was still languishing in depression in 1937, uh, four years after Roosevelt had become president. Even Roosevelt's good friend, Henry Morgenthau, who was his Secretary of Treasury, longtime friend. Morgenthau even had a picture of himself with Roosevelt, and Roosevelt had signed it and said to Henry, uh, one of two of a kind. So Morgenthau really enjoyed his relationship with Roosevelt. But Morgenthau became so sad by this 20% unemployment in 1939 that he finally uh, had an outburst where he, he was observing that the New Deal isn't working, that we're not really helping people. Here's what he said. We have tried spending money. We are spending more than we have ever spent before and it does not work. And I have just one interest and if I am wrong somebody else can have my job. I want to see this country prosperous. I want to see people get a job. I want to see people get enough to eat. We have never made good on our promise. I say after eight years of this administration, we have just as much unemployment as when we started and an enormous debt to boot. You never want a serious crisis to go to waste. And what I mean by that, it's an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before. You don't need to hear another list of statistics to know that our economy is in crisis. We owe it to each of them and to every single American to act with a sense of urgency and common purpose. The situation could not be more serious. Progressives know how to take advantage of a crisis. Uh, their ideas lie in wait, uh, sort of lie in the weeds, uh, as it were. Uh, and as contemporary progressives today are fond of saying, uh, they like to take advantage of crises. Ordinarily, uh, it's hard to get people to swallow whole uh, such a radical agenda. Uh, and they're only going to do it when their guard is down. In times of crisis, Americans sacrifice. We give up rights for the good of the country. We take off our belts and shoes at the airport. We agree to ration gas. We even accept the notion that neighbors, friends, are a threat to security based on their race. We stand by while fellow citizens are imprisoned for exercising the right of free speech. You see, a crisis makes us vulnerable susceptible to all those who have power and claim to have the answer to any and every problem. Every progressive administration in history has used a crisis and formed it into a war or the moral equivalent of war to push through an agenda that would otherwise be patently rejected. With Wilson, FDR, and Obama, the playbook is the same. No time for debate. If we drag our feet and fail to act, this crisis could turn into a catastrophe. No time to consider the option. Enacting this plan is both urgent and essential to our recovery. To see that the time for talk has passed, and that now is the time to take bold and swift action. No time for opposition. And you see folks waving tea bags around. You would think they would be saying thank you. But I will always be be honest with you about the challenges we face. I will listen to you, especially when we disagree. And it turns out, not so much. Americans of all political persuasions are finding out now that the voice of the people is not really that big of a priority in the progressive game plan. A decided majority made it clear they had no interest in the president's brand of health care reform, but it didn't seem to matter. We have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. They don't think there's anything Congress can't do. They don't think there's anything they can't do. And when they asked um, Speaker Pelosi while the health care reform was pending, what is it about the Constitution that empowers you to adopt President Obama's health care proposal, her response, recall, was, ha, 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 you've got to be kidding, ha, ha, ha. And it seems to me that that's exactly the attitude of a Democratic Party. I don't think that those that are transforming and those that uh, are shifting 
actually have confidence in the heart, the will, and the thought processes, even the decision making of the people. Again, to history and FDR for insight. May 1936, FDR advisor Raymond Moley writes in his personal journal that FDR is frustrated by discussion in the newspapers and amongst his very own cabinet about some of the policies he wishes to invoke. Moley says, I answered that it seemed to me that the only alternative to a discussion within the government of policies and the evolution of proposals for which the party should take responsibility was a dictatorship. He, FDR, then said, no, it's leadership. Those that oppose the will of government are labeled unpatriotic, dangerous, and they are relentlessly attacked and discredited. I mean, the reality of it is that Fox News often operates almost as either the research arm or the communications arm of the Republican Party. The only argument Anita was making is that they're not really a news station. If you watch even, it's not just their commentators, but a lot of their news programming. It's really not news. It's pushing a point of view. Federal spending is now $1 trillion more than it was at the end of 2008. The national debt is $4 trillion higher. Unemployment has nearly doubled while the federal workforce has grown by more than 600,000 people, easily dwarfing FDR's massive New Deal government in size and scope. Health care reform alone has added 159 new committees, agencies, and bureaucracies. Whether you realize it or not, higher taxes are already on their way. Many hidden in government fees and penalties on banking and other businesses that will most certainly be passed on to you, the consumer. And it is an absolute certainty that more are on the way. We are on a completely unsustainable fiscal path in which uh, we are expecting to borrow a trillion dollars a year at the level of the federal government for the rest of time, as far as I can see. Uh, if we carry on on this path, the ratio of federal debt to gross domestic product will explode to 400% by the time we get to 2040, which makes us actually on a worse path than Greece. They're, they're betting on the new normal. They're betting on the idea that we get accustomed with a 40% tax bracket to a 50% tax bracket and a 54% tax bracket, and we continue to start to gravitate up without feeling the pain threshold. As Margaret Thatcher, and I paraphrase horribly, but you can never, you know, you've never seen uh, a country tax itself into prosperity. It just doesn't work. With health care and financial reform in place, the federal government will now control 70% of the U.S. economy. 70%. New stimulus packages with names like the Jobs Bill and Cash for Caulkers are being rolled off the legislation assembly line with frightening regularity. And the rhetoric from the White House continues to hint at another major stimulus package yet to come. The major misconception with regard to stimulus programs is that they work. Fiscal stimulus involves looting some por portion of the population in order to hand that money to arbitrarily chosen people who just happen to be in the favor of certain politicians. I think when you spread the wealth around, it's good for everybody. There's no question, massive redistribution of wealth is part of the goal here. And what, what we're seeing already with health care is a huge redistribution of wealth. Any health care funding plan that is just, equitable, civilized, and humane must, must redistribute wealth from the richer among us to the poorer and the less fortunate. Excellent health care is by definition redistributional. Social justice is a, a, another way, it's a euphemism for uh, economic redistribution, essentially. It's the idea that free markets aren't fair, or they're not just, that um, going out in a free market and, and earning the wage or earning the profit that you're able to command on the market is not fair, and so the government should take money from some people and give it to other people. I, I think there's a certain resentment that comes across towards America, towards successful people in America, towards wealth. Uh, towards achievements and a certain psychological, political joy uh, in bringing those people down and bringing 
people to their knees. In the end, it's about power and control, and of course, re-election. Progressives believe in the welfare state, where government assumes the role of God and parent. The government is responsible to provide for the needs of its citizens, and no one gets too far ahead or behind. Capitalism is kept under strict control. Under this form of government, institutions like the church, business, the chamber of commerce, the NRA, are co-opted or somehow discredited. You know, you could have a president, you could have a senate, you could have courts without a written constitution, but when Americans invented the idea of written constitutions, the idea was to say, okay, here are the things you can do, that's it. Just like Wilson and FDR, President Obama doesn't see it that way. Generally, the Constitution is a charter of negative liberties, says what the states can't do to you, says what the federal government can't do to you, but it doesn't say what the federal government or the state government must do on your behalf. Statism, in whatever form, is flourishing again, in spite of its failures, in spite of the fact, because it's, it fits. It fits their worldview, and ideas drive history. And if you have bad ideas, are going to go bad, but you're going to keep explaining them away, just like, just like I'm sure when the five-year plan didn't work in the Soviet Union, they always had a reason. It was never communism's fault. There was always some conspiracy, something going on that was to blame for the fact that the five-year plan wasn't working. The welfare state, long prevalent in Europe, became even more commonplace following the depression of the 1930s in World War II. Many European countries viewed it as a midpoint between full-out communism and capitalism. The road to serfdom. Greece, the UK, Spain, Portugal, France, Ireland, welfare states and countries all on the brink of financial ruin. An eventuality that could bring down the entire globe. These countries now face a near impossible task of reneging on the welfare state promises of high-paying, low-output jobs early retirement, massive pensions, and universal health care. What you're witnessing right now is an attempt to storm Parliament. And this is a socialist government, and they believe that what they're about to do to vote through these austerity measures is completely against the people. It seems as though there is no way out of this mess. And on top of that, now Germany's Angela Merkel is saying sanctions may need to be put in place, as this could affect the entire continent. Meanwhile, the fundamental transformation of America has us marching down the same path. If you just look at what happens when spending gets seriously out of control, the development, what, what happens is surprisingly similar. You go from higher prices, price controls, wage controls, shortages, rationing, social conflict, and ultimately if the inflation is bad enough, you often end up with a dictatorship. Without a doubt, the situation inherited by the Obama administration was dire. Massive deficit, unsustainable Social Security and Medicare costs, and rising unemployment. But the remedy, the transformation, has been to pour gasoline on an already raging inferno. I think we need to look very seriously at the unfunded liabilities of Medicare and Social Security. These are not st stated as part of the federal debt. They are off-balance sheet uh, liabilities, and they're colossal. Maybe 40, 50, 60 trillion dollars of unfunded liabilities. And there is absolutely no uh, intention, as far as I can see, on the part of this administration to address those issues. Now, the incredible thing to me about Obama, what, what I think is really scary about Obama is he's, he, he clearly has this radical vision of a government-run government economy, and he has been completely oblivious to the massive evidence of, of failure. So where do we go from here? Well, once again, if we look, history provides a roadmap, an alternative to the dead-end path of fundamental transformation, a turn off that road to serfdom. I suppose the first one is to remember it's that seven American economic growth, the rise of the United States to be the world's number one economy, has been primarily the product of private sector innovation and entrepreneurship, not government intervention. In times of true crisis, our nation has always produced an unlikely hero or heroes who have performed remarkable feats. 
Some would say miracles bring us back from the brink. Case in point, Forgotten Depression, 1920. Mired in the progressive cancer brought on by the Wilson administration, President Warren Harding, Vice President Calvin Coolidge, and Secretary of Treasury Andrew Mellon perform an unlikely miracle. Andrew Mellon came up with the idea that tax rates, especially the top marginal rates, were so high that, in fact, they were, they were strangling the economy and they were probably reducing revenues. So he said, we've got to start cutting these rates. And in fact, they were able, as I said, they were able to cut the national debt by one third, even while pursuing that strategy. Example two, the year is 1946. World War II has come to an end. Economists far and wide are predicting a return to the depression for the United States as the war machine is dismantled. We're gonna have eight million people unemployed, 10 million people, 12 million people unemployed because the government won't be spending as much money anymore. There were calls for massive government stimulus programs, another new deal. But America had had enough. Republicans gained control of Congress and placed their bet on capitalism and free enterprise. We did exactly the very thing that the so-called experts told us we couldn't do. Did we have massive unemployment and huge depression? To the contrary, if you look at the statistics, 1946 was the single most robust year for the private economy in all of American history, with a 30% increase in private production. More recently, remember the 1970s? To say the country was in a crisis would be an understatement. President Nixon resigned in shame. The Vietnam War ends in American frustration. Stocks collapse. Double-digit inflation settles in. There's an energy crisis. Whispers of a looming depression. And the decade is topped off with the taking of the American hostages in Iran. But here comes the unlikely hero in 1980, perhaps the most unlikely in our history, an actor by the name of Ronald Reagan. He called for restoration, not transformation. He implored Americans to return to the values and ideals embraced by our founders. He reminded us that high taxes and oppressive government regulation was a formula for disaster. The economic ills we suffer have come upon us over several decades. They will not go away in days, weeks, or months, but they will go away. They will go away because we, as Americans, have the capacity now, as we've had in the past, to do whatever needs to be done to preserve this last and greatest bastion of freedom. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. From time to time, we've been tempted to believe that society has become too complex to be managed by self-rule. That government by an elite group is superior to government for, by, and of the people. Well, if no one among us is capable of governing himself, then who among us has the capacity to govern someone else? Today, right now, America needs her heroes. Men and women who will question boldly sacrifice personal gain for the preservation of liberty people who will seek honest answers while declining the partisan leanings of those who care more about re-election than the good of the republic the constant the take it to the bank certainty is that in a time of crisis in america the cure the path off the brink is restoration fundamental restoration never transformation a return to our history, to honor, the embracing of our Constitution and all it stands for, and the unabashed declaration that all men and women are created equal, but are free to pursue their own level of happiness and prosperity. The freedom, the self-rule that trumps tyranny and oppression each and every time. This is America, and America waits for the next Washington Jefferson, Lincoln, or Reagan. America needs you.
America needs your family, your friends, and your neighbors.